In episode 12, we talk about how much Cody Gibson hates Brad Katona. I'm sitting there at the table while they get into a heated 15, 20 minute argument. We do a crawfish boil. Connor takes his dudes gambling and Cody Gibson punches his ticket to the finale this weekend in Boston. I break it all down with one half of Bustin' with the Boys, former NFL star Will Compton. Bruce, hit him with the intro. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! The Ultimate Fighter Season 31 Reaction Show, brought to you by Car Shield. Hosted by Michael Adler. That's right, boys and girls. You heard the man Bruce Buffer himself. This is episode 12 of the Ultimate Fighter Tough 31 reaction show hosted by yours truly, Michael Chandler, and brought to you by Car Shield. Now, before we get into the show, which was an amazing show, our giveaway winner for the week, Connor, who was the who was the winner? We've got James Fairbanks. James Fairbanks from you say Nebraska? It's from Nebraska. James Fairbanks from yes. Nebraska. Sir. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why that is important here in a second. So what is our, our giveaway? Signed copy of As a Man Thinketh with a very cool bookmark, a signed panini card with yours truly. Now, as we get into the show, just watched it with a very good friend of mine, nine-year NFL veteran, still on a quest for year 10, still up, up for debate. We might get there. We don't know. He's one half of the Golden Voices, the hilarious, awesome dudes of Bussin' with the boys and a good friend of mine, Mr. Will Compton. How are we? Okay. And hey. played in Nebraska. Played in Nebraska. So that so. winner, James, you said James who? James Fairbanks. James Fairbanks. James He's Fairbanks. From Elkhorn. Dude. Nebraska's <laughs> everywhere, man. <laughs> dude, I was in Italy and saw somebody decked out in Nebraska gear. Get out of here. And I was dude. like, uh, well, I like walked around the corner and I hear Will and I like look over and I was like, oh, go big red, dude. He's no like, dude, way. I was just watching one of your videos on Twitter. I was like, let's fuck. Hey, dude, up. hey, you run into a lot of people these days, but dude, did you ever think you were gonna run into some dude wearing all no. Nebraska stuff in no Venice Nebraska or the hat? Heck? Nebraska, it said Huskers across the shirt, just with his family, decked out in red. Was and it's like, bro, they're everywhere. Was we're everywhere. Oh, the the corn the corn the huskers, corn are, huskers everywhere, are everywhere, dude. dude. Kind of like the Mizzou Tigers, but no <laughs> Tigers ain't nobody. Uh, dude, so yeah, you just got back from Italy. I yeah, saw, I was I was following. Well, first of all, you see I, the tan. I see the tan. Tan this looks good. You said, all, you, said you ate been. all carbs the whole time. You only gained only gained one pound. That's good. Brother, a lot of walking. A lot of walking. In a lot of walking. I average. So I think at the most sixteen thousand steps, but averaging around ten thousand a day. Dude, that's a lot of sun. And yeah, I'm telling you all, I did nothing but carb load the entire time. And I was. We were on the flight back, and I was telling my wife, I was like, I wonder what the scale is going to read. Mm, and get on scary, I was a like scary moment 215.2 before I went when I got back I was last night 216.3 mm, so it was 1.1 pound don't 1.1 1. 1 1 pound don't you sneak but I'm telling you I, I like <laughs> I was testing the boundaries of eating I ate nothing That's but good. ravioli cannelloni homemade spaghetti dude. I was down in a basement Italian as fuck dude downstairs in a basement um and we, there's like nine of us, a little private group that did some home cooking with this oh, Italian I saw that. family. I saw that. Yeah. And oh, I was in there. an Italian family that wasn't at like a restaurant? No, that was just an Italian <laughs> family. We go in, you kind of like, we're standing at the gate, kind of like the start of a horror film. We get ringed in, we go up. There's gardens, there's there's this beautiful yard, greenery Dude, everywhere. Cool. These Italian women, older women come out, they're like yelling at each other in Italian in a nice way. They're talking, like, oh, ciao bella, ciao bella, <laughs> talking about Rue. Um, and uh, we go downstairs and massive... Massive cooking area, massive kitchen, a couple tables set up. Of course, one's going to be at this table. Of course, two's going to be at this table. We'll do the appetizers at the at this table, and we just we made homemade you pasta. Guys were all cooking, cooking for all each cooking. Other. Yeah, Home exactly. Style. Home style the way for it was, the entire the way time. It was supposed yeah, to be. with like this other couple. Man, I forget where they're from, and I want to butcher. But shout Nebraska. out, Mark. Yeah, Nebraska. <laughs> and then, a matter of fact, I think they were from Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin, because oh, cool. he was a Badgers fan. And then this family, uh, Italian New Yorkers. Dude. Italian New Yorkers, like, oh, that's how we do the pasta. Going back to that's the, how we to make the, the pasta. Yeah, the motherland, dude. And we're just sitting around having a great time. But dude, Italy was fantastic. Yeah, we, fantastic. We went there uh, years ago, ten years ago at this point. But um, a lot of fun. Yeah, bro. Of, and I did eat a lot of. You know what I had was the the carbonara, where it's just like a, basically olive oil. And yeah, it's like olive oil butter. 
or something. That's and that's Charles' favorite. Yeah, Car- yeah. The carbonara, a little bit of a little bit of ham or something in there. Yeah, prosciutto, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. Something I carb like I carb load, loaded a lot back then, but I yeah, I was. I, yeah, a lot of walking. A lot of walking, a lot a lot of of steps, walking out there. <laughs> we have Florence, Rome, Sorrento, and Capri, and then we saw a little bit of the. Uh, we saw the Amalfi Coast one day, but it was it was fantastic. Did you see the Colosseum? Yes. When I tell you Rome was cool. Rome was so cool. I've never been a history guy. I've been, I've always like growing up, I was a math science type guy over like the English and social studies and history. Never liked history. Always kind of hated it for, I don't even know what reason. But when I was over in Rome, I found myself like wanting to learn as much as possible. And then I'm like, man, I, I kind of want to read about history now. Cause you mm-hmm. learn about Marcus Aurelius with stoicism and everything else. And that kind of gets you going. Cause you see, you see his statue and then you're on these tours about the fall of ancient Rome and all the different emperors and how power shifted over time. Crazy. You know, Julius Caesar, all that stuff to where it's like, man, um, then I found myself on chat GPT on my app, just asking <laughs> questions about history, just going down wormholes. But, uh, how many people died inside the Coliseum? That's, that's what you got to ask. Them. I want to say it was like, uh, seven. Okay. This 100? is my, my, no, thousand. my wife and I were kind of, yeah, 7,000. Probably. My wife thought they, they said 70,000, but I believe that it was like 7,000 like warriors, gladiators, people that were fighting in the Coliseum, like bloodshed. Just for, just for entertainment. Too, just for the entertainment. <laughs> the Coliseum held 50 to 80,000 people at any, at any given day, on any given day, screaming for bloodshed, screaming for death. Death. Yeah. <laughs> man versus man, man versus animal, animal versus animal. Like I'm talking giraffes they're sending in there, exotic chains animals, chained. Yes. Just, fire. To, just for entertainment. And people loved it. They swarmed to the Coliseum. Why can't we do that anymore? You guys are the modern day, you guys are the modern day gladiators. We, uh, we, uh, we go in there and get after it. I'm getting like passionate about it Cause I really was thinking about you. I'm like, yo, I'm thinking about football. I'm like, man, we're kind of like some modern day gladiators. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yo, the UFC, you guys are the modern day gladiators for entertainment. For entertainment. For entertainment. Like in an octagon. We don't fight to the death, but somebody no. could die. Somebody could die. Somebody could yeah. Die. But you, you are, you're, you're on You're in an octagon for th- tens of thousands of people mm-hmm. screaming for Screaming for injury, whether or not it happens. <laughs> injury or bl- and bloodshed. Yeah, injury and bloodshed. I just want to see blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to see blood. And then like a Damar Hamlin situation happens on the football field, and then it kind of pauses for a minute. Like, hey, hang on now. Dude. But when you get back on Sunday, you're like, you, you people crave the violence. We are. I think I think human beings, as much as we want to not try to admit it or not, we like we like violence. Yeah. We like, we like battle. Yeah. We like, we like uh contention yeah you know i'll admit so. it dude i like some fucking violence <laughs> you definitely speaking you of like it, it yeah you like it more than i do <laughs> <laughs> no that's not i mean fuck I mean, you're I out fight, there battle. yeah you're out there fighting bro know, speaking I, of the ending of that the promo and of it seems like it's angling mm-hmm. even more chandler mm-hmm. versus mcgregor oh, yeah. big fan of cody gibson i'm excited to, uh, i'm stoked to watch him fight this weekend against brad but i know i'm glad they finally announced it's gonna be this weekend in boston i'll be out there so it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun i got two two of my guys fighting each other hollaball and hubbard fighting each other for 155 title and then you got cody gibson who's on my team brad katona who is no longer on my team not on my team anymore. made the switch made the, the rat switch. The, rat, the, rat, the mold dude the, mat, the rat the mold made the yeah. switch <laughs> yeah. so we're, we're rooting rooting for cody gibson in that one for sure and then hollaball and hubbard made the best man win hopefully nobody gets, nobody gets hurt yeah that's all i care about. they've done a good job like uh promoting all this stuff up until now and i think too that little wrinkle at the end like you see all like i was following i've been following i clearly i follow you closely but i kind of watch all this stuff from afar. McGregor's so fickle when it comes to mm. basically like, guess who I'm going to fight? I'm in control. He all this stuff. He's doing that, dude. Right. And he's doing it. He's doing it because he's known, he's known that he was going to fight me the whole time. But he also knows or thinks that if he talks about this guy, goes in the bare knuckle ring against Mike Perry and faces off and he talks about Justin Gaethje with the BMF title and he talks about mm. Jake Paul and Nate Diaz and talking about the trilogy, he, he knows he, or at least he thinks the more he talks about that, the more I start second guessing, call my manager, call the UFC. Hey, what's going on when we fighting? Because we still don't have a fight date. Mm-hmm. So he's a, he's a master of mental warfare. So he's the smartest. He's the smartest guy when it comes to that stuff. Whether he does it because he just wants to be in the headlines, or he's doing it because he's trying to mess with me, or just trying to keep everybody on their toes. But obviously now you see, Connor and I are fighting. Have you, now he says December. Were you second guessing? Oh, of course. I mean, of course. There's there's days where you're just like, okay, well, there's still no end in sight, and I'm also. The reason I have been able to build what I've built in my career is I'm not that guy who I'm not going to be calling the UFC like, I want answers now. 
I deserve answers now. These guys are running the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest and best sports franchise on the entire planet, in my opinion. They got a lot of fish to fry. They got a lot bigger fish to fry than me trying to figure out when I'm fighting right now. So it's, I take my ego out of it and I say, listen, you guys figured out when you figured out, I'm gonna be over here, I'll be on the microphone, we're gonna be training, we're gonna be doing stuff, we're gonna be traveling, trying to keep myself busy outside of just thinking about, hey, when am I fighting Condor? He says it's December. I don't know if the UFC says it's December. I don't know if what the rules state, um, but I would love to fight him in December. It'd probably be that December 16th card, the last card of the year. Biggest pay-per-view or last pay-per-view of the year. I think it'll be whenever the UFC would want it to happen. Or oh, yeah, that too. So I yeah, see. I think Connor too, but like I was talking with uh I was the talking other with Connor. your board. The other yeah, producer when I say Connor, Connor when I yeah. say Connor, but like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. who's he talking about? Uh when I was talking with producer Connor, it's kind of like one of those things that Connor McGregor is a master when it comes to orchestrating a lot of his promo and build up and everything mm -hmm. else, but also He's done all these different switch ups, I guess we can call them with the BMF belt, the boxing, all the different stuff, right? To where it does seem like, oh, wow, that, it, maybe this fight isn't going to happen. I wonder what's going through Chandler's head. But also, it's one of those things, too, that the only way back in is it seems like all roads point to it has to go through you. And whether or not the UFC will ever come out and say that, I don't mm -hmm. think they ever will, because ultimately, I think they want somebody like McGregor doing whatever McGregor wants to do. But it's like that art of negotiation that Dana and that, that system, that machine knows is ultimately you want the art of negotiation as in allow them to have your way. So yeah. it's going to be figured out. A Connor's probably going to say, this is my path and this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, and it all, and Connor orchestrated, McGregor orchestrated it. But at the same time, you know, as powerful as the UFC is, it's going to be like, this is... He neg he's negotiating without actually negotiating Correct. with them. Actually, case in point, I was here. So this whole thing started, the Ultimate Fighter, and this is a good time to talk about it because it's the last episode. This Ultimate Fighter thing started not because the UFC announced it, but because Connor announced it on Twitter. And I got a call from Hunter Campbell that same day, like, hey, I don't know if you saw this thing, this guy, you know, we've talked to him about it, didn't want him to tweet it. He wasn't supposed to tweet it, blah, 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 blah. But here's what we're thinking. You want to do it? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So like Connor started the whole thing. That's what he likes to do, go against the grain, be his own promoter, if you will. And then, you know, the UFC and Connor kind of figured out negotiating. Dana will do a press conference knowing what he's saying is going to be a negotiation tactic mm. without actually negotiating with Connor. And then Connor's doing the exact same thing wherever he is, talking about whoever he's with. He, did you see this week? You probably didn't see it. You were flying, but AJ, Anthony Joshua fought this weekend. He gave him a, a, a cup of his his Irish stout, freaking <laughs> the, forged stout or whatever. Yeah, 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 right when he got beard. out of the ring, he's yelling at KSI. He's tweeting at KSI. He's calling KSI out. So there's always some kind of fighting with everybody. When Connor's it, calling KSI out? I mean, not really. He said he couldn't box if he, he couldn't <laughs> box if he was an egg boxer at an egg boxing factory oh, yeah. or something like that. Funny line, great line. <laughs> I'll give it to him. But it's also it's it's funny too because he does a really good job of like, hey, I know I'm fighting this guy, so I'm also not going to talk about him. That's why he talks about me less than he talks about anybody else, even though he knows he's going to fight me. So it's kind of a funny, interesting. What's Connor doing? From my perspective, from your perspective, from everybody's perspective, that's why everybody loves to follow the saga of Connor McGregor and his life, whether he's. In, it looks like he's in shambles about to go to jail or it looks like he's coming back and he's going to be a world champion or anywhere in between. People love to follow the saga. Of I tell you what, it is super interesting. I, cause I did catch uh, I want to say it was him and Jake Paul's back and forth. Yeah, and he yeah. like Jake Paul won that uh, nice little 10, nine round on social media by saying like, you need to check yourself into rehab mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. And I was like, man, what in the hell is going on out there? Well, it's funny that night Connor tweeted, screw it screw it, honey, comma, I'm up. What up? You know, like just kind of like during the night of the Jake Paul <laughs> Diaz fight, just yeah. to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm at my phone right now. Anybody want to yeah. tweet at me? I'm going to tweet it. You know, it's like, just to let him know that, Hey, anybody want to get into a verbal altercation? I'm here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But going back to what you were saying, when you're like, I remove my ego, you kind of let business handle business. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you remove the ego and you're still over here, I'm keeping myself busy. I'm keeping myself everything else. What is going through your mind? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely times, and, and the problem is too, because because I'll see I'll see you make posts, and then everyone will chime in and talk about, oh, this fight ain't happening. Like you're not you're sure. not fighting McGregor, and we're all human. We'll all read a couple every now and then. But mm -hmm. what is going through your mind when it's like, man, is this shit gonna happen? It just doesn't well, seem like I knew what I signed up for. I knew when I well, I knew when Hunter called me before it even really got ink on paper that we were doing mm -hmm. the Ultimate Fighter and gonna fight each other after. I just like, hey. Talked to my manager, Dave, and we're like, hey, just, just so you know, like we're, this is going to be a, the ride of your life. This is going to be different than anything else mm. you've ever gone through because of who is on the other side of the ticket, Connor. 
doing a reality show. This and there's going to be days where you're not like thinking, hey, this this fight ain't happening. There's going to be days that you're 100% secure that it's happening. And all the while, Connor, I shouldn't even be saying this publicly right now because I'm sure Connor's going to clip it. It's going to be a good, nice little clip and it's going to go out there. But also, you know, he 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 wants to he wants to be the puppet master, right? Mm -hmm. But the good thing is, man, like. Dude, I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm in a good spot. I know I'm fighting him. He knows he's fighting me, whether he talks about it or not. And then you're kind of just, you're also at the, you're sitting at the table of the court of public opinion as well. When, if I don't talk about Connor or call him out or people are like, Hey, you need to talk about this. You need to talk about that. You need to dig with this here and you need to, need to start a verbal altercation on Twitter and a Twitter war. And I'm like, that's not me. First of all, uh, second of all, that's not how, I don't think that's how you get a fight with Connor. Everybody tries to do it. And he actually never fights the guys that he, Twitter battles with Donald. The last guy that he fought in the UFC, I believe was, well, Dustin Poirier. They weren't really Twitter battling. You know, before that it was Cowboy Cerrone. They seemed really, like some Twitter DMs when they were battling. Well, there was, the yeah, there was, there was some stuff with the stuff DMs allegedly, you know? So like, I don't know. I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm fighting Connor. Obviously we they just announced this at the, at the end of the show. We're fighting. Uh, yeah. Dana just came out and said, he's coming back and fighting Connor. Connor just came back and said, I'm fighting Chandler next in December. Who knows if it's going to be December or not, but mm. either way, that's the fight that's happened. We, when he comes back to the UFC, he's not going to be able to just come back and say, I'm fighting X, Y, and Z, whoever. Mm. He's got to come back and, and fulfill the commitment that he already made of doing the ultimate fighter, saying he's going to fight me, facing off with me at the end of the show. And then now we're, uh, I'm, I'm game for December. I don't yeah. Know. I mean, it's kind of getting happens, but we'll formed see. and manipulated to mm -hmm. seem that way it's like yeah. yeah he is you know hats off to him he is very entertaining and he is like kind of like a master puppeteer but also it's like the minds of dana and hunter campbell and those guys they're geniuses as well yeah, so. they, they know what's going on so yeah. well, well hopefully i'll see him this weekend in, in boston uh so everybody make sure you guys tune in this weekend my guys are fighting i think cody gibson's gonna win it and then hollaball and hubbard freaking who you think's gonna win Ultimately, it's four Chandler guys, four it, team Chandler guys. Yeah. Brad made his switch. Yeah. You know, behind enemy lines. Between Hollaball, between Hollaball and Hubbard, man, if you would have asked me after the Lee Hammond fight with Hollaball, I'd say absolutely Hubbard's gonna run through him because Hubbard does have really good grappling. Um, but the way Hollaball just went out there and fought on the feet against Jason Knight, I don't think it's smart for him to necessarily do that with uh Austin Hubbard, because Austin Hubbard hits harder than Jason Knight. Jason Knight is more of a just beat you with a, a a lot of punches and a lot of cardio, whereas Austin Hubbard hits like a Mack truck. Um, so that one to me is is a true 50-50, and I'm not going to make a prediction. And I'm it's going to be I'm going to have that sharpie wherever that sharpie is, probably going to break it in my hand when I'm there watching those guys fight. But I will be very close to the Cody fight, yelling instructions for because I want Cody to go out there and smash Bracketona. And we're going to show ass. a clip. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and we're going to show a clip of that that later. Their little interaction. What's the first clip we uh? What's the first clip we got? You want to rewatch the fight? Oh yeah, we're gonna watch. We're gonna rewatch the fight, or we're gonna do the highlights. So we'll watch like the last minute and then the highlights. Yeah, and let me let me lay a little bit of groundwork. So going into this fight, I actually was sitting here while we were watching. I was like, I actually don't remember how this fight went. I did, couldn't remember if it was a finish. Couldn't remember if it was a decision. Um, but I do remember being extremely confident because I think Cody Gibson is the most talented 135er on the show. Obviously, now we saw he's in the finals. I think he's better than Brad Katona. I thought he was, I thought he was head and shoulders above Rico DeShulo. I didn't remember that he finished him in the first round via arm triangle, but um, once he got on top, dude, it was. It's it impressive was how much Nebraska wrestling. Yeah, dude. Nebraska <laughs> wrestling, Mizzou yeah. wrestling, dude. It was uh, it was cool to see. I mean, he was in control the entire fight. This right here, for those that don't know, or even for you, this body triangle where you literally make a triangle out of your leg, you hook your foot behind your own your own knee. This is one of the toughest spots to be in in the entire sport of mixed martial arts. And then I remember watching this saying, gosh, dude, Cody is mean. Watch these punches. Boom. <laughs> these, he's such a mean, mean SOB, dude. So now I'm actually happy. And he didn't hate Rico. He hates Brad Katona. So I can't wait to watch him fight this weekend. Why is this position the worst one to be in? Well, because normally, basically it's locked above your waist. So your feet can move all they want. But you're, he's locking you up right in between your upper body and your lower body. Your strongest part of your body, you really can't use that much because you're not locked around. If he had both legs in, he can use, Rico can use both of his legs if he has kind of those hooks in, we call them. Um, but since he had it locked around the waist, you just can't move. That's why I, in, against Charles Oliveira, I stood up and did like the back slam thing, which kind of loosened it up and I was able to reverse it. But now he's just on top, but then I think Rico ends up spinning out and then 
Cody's top pressure because he was a wrestler, wrestled in high you school. You can tell. You can tell he's very mm-hmm. good at leg riding. Yeah, dude. And that's that's what he said leading up to this. He's and we knew this too because shout out to Hunter who lost to Rico. Love Hunter, but he lost to Rico. But he dominated him in the first round, was on top the entire time. We knew Rico didn't have had good striking, but didn't have a, a lot to offer on the ground. So I knew when Cody was able to lock this up, he was going to be able to do this for 15 minutes each round if he wanted to, and then maybe get the finish or a TKO or a submission. Um, yeah, I mean, he dominated on the ground. Man. He, I mean, look how long he is, man. Yeah. Rico's, Rico's a taller dude, too, but Cody is huge. And for it just seems class. like Rico's just in a scramble the entire time, just trying to regain yeah. any type of balance. Yeah, and this is a this is a exhausting place to be in in mixed martial arts, too. Because he, basically you got to roll, you got to just try and go back and forth. Mm, yeah. I mean, basically. that's that's the most butchered non-fighting way of trying yeah. to explain that. You just got to, like, roll. <laughs> you just got to roll. That's what I said last week, though. Like, I mean, sometimes... Sometimes it's not about the techniques and it's not about the hand here, foot here, pressure, pressure here, you know, upper body, lower body. It's just about, hey, just just get up and be an athlete. Just explode. Just move. Grab a hand and explode and move. But Rico is starting to bleed here. Cody is just just raining like, arrows on. Yeah, yeah, so you said raining arrows. I like it. dude. And then he starts hitting with some elbows and Rico does get a little bit of a uh, um, kind of a a reversal and gets out a little bit. Cody does a really good job of staying, staying sticky, keeps an ankle. You, as you know, in wrestling, the, the guy who gets higher, the guy who, who has the higher body, the higher position is going to win. He elevates the leg right after this and ends up getting back on top and then ends up finishing him with the arm triangle. So right now we're still, we're already f- a little bit over four minutes in. He grabs this leg. This was a great that, job by Cody. Elevates that leg and now he's on top. So if you get higher, he, he immediately got reversed and then he immediately stood up and got his body higher. So for every young athlete there in the grappling exchange, that's where you want to be. Get higher than your opponent and then locks in this arm triangle in, which is a lot tighter in a transition. You hear Rico I mean, gurgling a little bit. Suffocating and Rico's man. tough, dude. Rico is Boston, Boston tough, man. And, you know, it's just one of those positions where you're just like, man, I got to let this one go. Well, yeah, in 36, you're, you're literally you're fighting for your life. Yeah. Yeah, and Rico's, not just your career. Like you got two kids back home. Like you are fighting for your life. You're you're trying to get to the final to get another opportunity. This was this was this was Rico's best opportunity to get to the next level, and this was Cody's best second chance he ever could have asked for. You know. And you were talking earlier, like the the one who has. I think you were saying like the higher the the higher level, the higher ground. Like how he's riding him the whole time. Mm-hmm. Even even that, I don't think people understand how hard it is to maintain that much control and, and seem that calm on top. Like I when he was reversing around and keeping all that, I was literally thinking in my head, like, man, I wonder if he like wrestled. Cause this dude is riding legs, yeah. like a champion, the ability, the ability to not force anything, you know, cause Cody could have forced his legs in. he could have forced position a couple different times. He did a really good job of, we call it floating mm-hmm. where you're, you, where you're letting it, it's almost like you're letting the pressure off and you're letting a guy move underneath you until he gets to a position where you can then, then attack or go back to a better position. Um, so he did a really good job of that. Also, while raining arrows on him, and then he started hitting with some elbows, which then it's one thing to have another dude on top of you, kind of whether he's hard pressuring you or he's floating and letting you move. But that's a whole other thing whenever you get stuck in a position and the dude's hitting you with like 25 punches, mm-hmm. elbows, whatever it might be. Then you then that then that panic starts to set in. And then you make a guy. A lot of times I talk about position first position first, then damage. And then with the damage, make the guy second guess or panic in the scenario. And then that's where exactly what he did. He let Rico kind of panic, had his arm up and then he caught him in the arm triangle. It was a perfect transition arm triangle. That was a, that was a a good performance by Cody and Cody. Yeah, yeah, dude, the first, the first one, Cody looked a lot better uh, on the feet and pushing Mondo up against the cage because Mondo was a strong wrestler. So he kind of showed Cody to me showed the best the best well-rounded athlete on the show mm-hmm. compared to going back to, we talk about the Hollaball and the Hubbard fight. You look at Hollaball, I think Hollaball, Kurt Hollaball put on the best striking performance we've seen in tough for a very long time. And then, but he showed very questionable ground game against Lee Hammond in his first fight, you know? So you kind of start piecing these things together and it's going to depend on who shows up this weekend, a couple of days from now, in Boston to be able to go get their hand raised. So it's it's gonna be a fun one, man. Yeah. And Cody seems to use his length. He said it too in the in his uh you know the interview leading up to the fight. He is he did a really good job like showing off his length there. Cause there's nothing like 
back when I'd get my ass whipped on the wrestling mat. Somebody's <laughs> riding legs on you that's long, that oh. understands how to do it well. Cody, my brother, he always did that very he well. He was tall. Yeah, was tall, like, long, tall yeah. For and you had somebody who could just ride legs and kind of like you said, like mm. floating to where they're just cool, calm, and collected, letting you do whatever and wear yourself out. And they just seem so confident, just waiting for their moment to essentially strike and yeah. end the fight. And the clock, the clock is running. So you know when you're on bottom, you're losing every single second that that clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. You're also getting hit. You're also ex you're also getting more and more tired while the other guy on top is just kind of he's just kind of buying his time. You know, you don't have to force anything in some in a lot of these scenarios. And I'm a guy who forces things a lot, but it's uh, you know, someday I'll get better at it. Now's a good time to thank our show sponsor, CarShield. We're all about who's the greatest here, and CarShield really goes to the mat for vehicle owners. They're the number one most trusted auto service protection company in America, and they're here to help protect you from surprise car repair costs. Flexible month-to-month -month plans through CarShield can cover up to 5,000 parts of your car after they break down. When you're covered through CarShield, you'll always have someone in your corner at the repair shop. Visit carshield.com and check it out now. Now, back to the show. How, how old are you? 37. Okay. So you could resonate with these guys in their mm -hmm. situations. Do you, how, put me in the, the mental of somebody like Rico, like in your mind, is there a path to get into the UFC? Like at what point are you essentially being like, I need to kind of pivot and do something else because you're kind of like, even, even these fighters, like they're going to get their moments in the UFC. Right. But mm -hmm. on a very low level, um, at what point do you figure out, am, am I doing this? It's tough for everybody. That 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 is the age old question. Same thing with football. It's mm -hmm. like when, okay, maybe maybe you get cut from the team, but you might get picked up from another team or get put on waivers or whatever. You understand that more than I do, but you, you kind of just keep going until you're like, well, there's not really any suitors or maybe I, or maybe I just don't want to do it anymore. You know, whether it's risk versus reward, money versus damage, you know, money versus lifestyle. Do I want to, you know, Cody, and this is what I always said too, from the very beginning, and it ticks me off every time I see it is like, well, of course the veterans won because how are the veterans not going to beat the prospects? You got to remember Cody Gibson's a high school teacher in California. Uh, Austin Hubbard, oh, Austin Hubbard works a full-time job with, right. with his father-in-law. Um, who else was there? Uh, I forget, but half of my team already has other jobs and they're kind of one foot in one foot out. Hey, if it works out, I'm going to keep pursuing Cause you it. have to be. Yeah. But if it doesn't work out, I got this other thing to quote unquote fall back on. So a lot of my guys had plan B's, whereas these prospects are still young. Most of them were younger than my, my veterans, salty, full of piss and vinegar. Like, Hey, I'm getting to the UFC. I'm going to the UFC. So I think it's an unfair statement. Of course, now we can look back and say, okay, the veterans won. So it makes sense that people would say that. But at the very beginning, I was questioning all my guys. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, you've all been quote unquote losers. You're quote unquote told you're not good enough. Quote unquote said, Hey, the UFC didn't want you. Here's your walking paper papers. Get out. You're not good enough. So how much did that play into their psyche? Do they see themselves as a winner or do they see themselves as a, as a cut from the UFC has been? And that's why I always said the X's and O's were going to be important, but it was more the heart and it was more the mind of loving these dudes and, and my coaching staff, loving on these dudes, making these guys look in the mirror and say, Hey, I deserve to be here and I deserve to be in the UFC. And that's where I think we did a really good job of just loving on these dudes and making them feel like, hey, this dude who's fighting Connor next, he's, it's his name on the back of the jersey, but he's here and he wants, he believes that I can do it. So why can't I do it? Mm. You know? So it was, it was so much more mental, spiritual, emotional than it was going out there and knocking dudes out and, and choking people. Yeah. I think it's fascinating, man. I think Cody's a great example, like Rico too, but Cody being the victor, I mean, his record up there while he's fighting is 19 and eight. Yeah. And I watched that him from episode two, that was that night I texted you like, Hey man, it's really cool watching you be on the coaching side of everything. Cause I think you do, I think you're really good at it, bro. And I think you do a really good job of helping guys believe in themselves more, not saying that they doubted their ability. Obviously, like, like you said, they had their plan B figured out, but their plan B is forced because they have to provide mm -hmm. for a family with two kiddos and everything else. Like you saw Cody's FaceTime with his family. Like there are tears happening yeah, we were over here because I, yeah, I know like, you sit there and you kind of feel the little <laughs> scratching going on in your nose, but these guys have a forced plan B and they're still kind of hanging on to that. Am I has been mm -hmm. doubt, like insecurity, like I, yeah, I mean, I'm getting coached by Chandler and I also see McGregor and this, level that feels like it is above me and I'm trying again and again and again mm -hmm. and I thought that you guys and your team did such a great job of of just like I don't know getting on their level marinating with them 
And I think uh, Cody had a lot of good things to say about you on that episode. Like, you can just tell he cares. I, I think you do a hell of a job. But it's truly fascinating to see somebody at 35, 36, 37 really trying to still hang on. And mm. you got a lot of people who are like, yeah, why are you still trying? Guaranteed. That's yeah. what these guys all, all have to do. And you probably see it in your sport as well or in football, in the NFL. It's 1, like, yeah, this dude's quote unquote over the hill for a football player. Why is he still, yeah. why is he still chasing it? Right. You know, why are like, you playing in the arena league? Why are you playing yeah. in the XFL? Why are you doing all these things? Things when it seems like the road's going to be like, you need to start figuring out what your next move Especially is. Especially when it comes to the money aspect too. I mean, mm. you know, these guys who are fighting on these local scenes, they might be making 500 bucks a fight. Right. You know, you got to train six weeks, part, working part-time, working full Putting together a syllabus yeah. and yeah. getting 500 bucks on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like, and you might have to, yeah, I mean, you might be making 500 bucks, 800 bucks, thousand bucks. If you got to go travel and then you got gas, hotel, food and all that stuff, you're like, okay. I just did this to get another win on my record, but I didn't really make any money either, you know? So that's the hard part about that road back to the UFC. And then when you get to the UFC, how much are you going to make? I don't know if you're going to be on a 10, 10 and 10 contract, you make 10,000 bucks or whatever it might be. It's a, it's a, it's a tough road. And that's why I, I, I thank God I've never really been in that scenario in my, in my fight career, but I've been around so many guys and it's always been that encouragement of, Hey man, so many more guys have been in your position and got back to the big show, got back to a big contract, could have won a, won a world title even after they were written off by everybody. Yeah. And that's that's why we love sports, not just mixed martial arts, but all sports. We love the man in the arena, going back to the Coliseum. Like we, whether we hate, we as a society hate on those guys all the time and we're all keyboard warriors, we love to see the man in the arena or the woman in the arena, you know, but it's, yeah. you know, it's like, it's uh, it's cool, man. It was a, it was the a story. really fun. Ex yeah, I mean, people love the story, and like, that's why this, that's why this show did well because we kept telling the story of who these guys are, who they were, who they aren't, who they are. You know, it's pretty, pretty. Cool. Right. It's it, you know, it's like when you're in these guys' spots and positions, or anybody trying to accomplish something or achieve something at this level, is like you have this entire world external. Mm -hmm. That's trying to tell you who you are, who you aren't and everything in between. And you have to lay on your pillow with all of that doubt and, and, you know, belief too mm -hmm. that, Hey, I, I'm going to continue forward. I'm going to persevere. And if it doesn't happen, this one, like, you know, when do I sit down and make that choice? Do I need to keep going? It's, it's the story and the climb. And you saw it here, a 36 year old and 35 year old go, going at it just for a, a finale shot to, you know, how much are, do you think they'll make in, in this weekend? Like $10,000? Probably. Ten thousand dollars. I actually, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the like the ultimate fighter contract is different than the other contract. So I don't right. really, you know, I don't really know. And you know, in part, partly, if people could say, oh, they need to make more money. I'm like, yeah, I would love for all of us to make more money too. But it's also if you do your job, if you go out there and you win, you string together some wins, you get on bigger and bigger contracts. Be a good employee, keep your nose clean, stay out of the bad headlines, stay in the good headlines, put on a good face, put on a good show, and you're gonna things are gonna work out for you. Might take longer than you want it to, but it's gonna it's gonna work out. Would so. you have ever saw yourself on a Ultimate Fighter show it in your thirties? Mm. Let's say that that was the route. Do you think you would have it's continued tough. down the path that long? It's tough because we're all we're all we all create you know our new mindset and our heart set on what our current circumstances are now. So if you ask me now, I'm like no, probably not. You know, I mean even even you know today if it, if if I got cut today, I'd be like okay, well I'm not gonna keep fighting back. I'm just gonna go do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where I'm at. But I've been in a great spot for the last 10, 12 years, you know, it's been, it's been a good ride and, you know, but I, so I, it was funny being with these guys and me and Cody are the same age yet. It feels like I'm coaching. Like if I was a high school wrestling coach or if I was a college wrestling coach, like I'm X amount of years above slash age slash experience slash accomplishment success, but we're the same age, you know? So it was, it was a, it was an interesting thing. I mean, Austin Hubbard as well, Kurt Hollibaugh, you know, these guys were, couple of years younger than me, mm. max, you know, so they were all in their thirties. Looking up to you, looking to you for some guidance, some advice. Yeah. And also I wanted to, to cut their teeth, like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and two back to the point of being like, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bad argument on the whole veteran versus prospects. Like at the end of the day, all professional sports, it's a young man's game out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Experience does matter. And, and clearly it, it helped play a role for them, but it's because they're still just as hungry as that young wolf trying to climb the hill, dude. Yeah. How, how well are they taking care of themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, this old, you know, that, you know, your 26 year old doesn't have to take, take, keep pair, take care of himself as much as your 36 year old, you know, right. like this sport, every sport, you know? Yeah. Gosh, I love it. Cause there's like two, there's like two, 
two levels of thinking for me. It's like, man, why do these guys still do this at this age? But then you sit there and watch and listen to some of the story and you're just, you fall in love. You're like, man, I love that these dudes stay, you know, stay disciplined to what the, to what they believe. Boy, and cut out the noise, cut out voices like the first one that I was just saying and be like, nah, fuck that. Like I, I want to, I want to be in that octagon. I don't care for how much money it is. I want to prove to myself that I fucking belong and that's in this Cody, world. That's where Cody was too. Cause like I said, I, I've been vocal because there was, there was moments where I was like, dang dude, does, does Cody have that belief? He, you know, he didn't cut weight to that first weight cut. I thought it was going to be a little bit tough, you know, he ended up crushing it and being a professional, but it was it was a tough weight cut for him. And then certain things I would hear him say, I'm like, oh, does he believe that he can go out there and beat Mondo in the first fight? But then now you see him, you see the way he competes, and now you see how much he hates Brad Katona. And it's not just because he hates Brad. He's also, he's also uh, it's welling up inside of him that like, hey, dude, I'm here and I am so close to winning this thing. I'm going to go ahead and just make you public enemy, Cody enemy number one. And we have that, do you have that clip of that argument? I want to pull up because uh, these because I was sitting there. I went over there for the crawfish boil, and and the whole team, both teams were there, um, and we were all eating, and it was fun. But and then all of a sudden, I guess the day before, the day before, and because Brad Katona roomed with Cody, because you got to remember too, sixteen dudes, one house, six bedrooms, whatever it might be. There was two bunk beds or one bunk bed and one regular bed in that in that room, and I think Brad Brad Katona would open up the window in the middle of the night even though he had two other roommates, you know, it's like, he's making a decision based on his needs and his wants. Mm -hmm. And Cody's like, what the hell dude? Like turned it off, like close the window. And Cause I think it was a, a constant back and forth about the window, about Brad chomping or Brad being, being too loud or whatever. Uh, but I was here, roll the clip. Cause this is when he's like, why does everybody pick on me? And it's, it's funny. Cause like, oh, and this is, I'm pretty sure this says F you, Brad. Someone put, <laughs> someone wrote out. him a it's note. Loud, three feet from my here. Yeah, dude. And he's like talking I'm loud. Table, I'm Brad's sitting at the kitchen table. Through. Cody says something and then Brad is coming back and they were, they sat there and just kind of argued back and forth. I can tell you this right now. I don't, Cody, Cody does not like Brad Katona. Hates whatsoever. him. I don't know why you dislike me so much, Cody. Bro, you're the most I don't know why you dislike me. You've complained this entire most time. Most self-centered, self-centered person. Entire time. 35 years of everything I've done that hasn't really affected you. Brad is 100% a diva. <laughs> a diva. That was, that was the hardest part, too. He himself. Well, he know? said, I can't wait to I smash you. It's going to be like Christmas. Just, can't wait to smash know, you. It's imagine that, like dude. Christmas. Christmas. Mr. Gibson, the, the <laughs> history <laughs> teacher. I don't know what he teaches. Just telling you, like well, and everyone was, hates you. That was a, that was a good play by Brad. No, he he did. He's like, what kind of example are you setting to your students right now? He's like, I'm setting a good example because you're you're a bully and you're self He's like, you're a bully. He had him mixing his words a little bit. I am setting a good example. Trying to be a good example for your students. There it is. You were a teacher. Yeah, bullies are gonna get. I, I, I am being a good example. Of <laughs> he kids. caught him for a minute. They did. They need to get called out. When they need, they need to be a, that bullied. Dude, because right? you know, like, hey, that that's a work? smart play oh, by Brad. Because you know, team. you know, Cody came into this I thinking, feel, okay, I'm a little bit different than everybody else team. here because I got 25 team. students in my oh, class. Well, actually, he probably It's has like a, the movie Warrior. Yeah, he's got a, probably got a bunch of students. He's got to be like, okay, well, I want to come here. Maybe I want to drop some F bombs, and they've never heard that before. Maybe I'm going to bloody someone up maybe yeah. i'm gonna get into a verbal altercation with this dude in the kitchen but i got these young kids you know looking up to me and i think it's one thing to be it's one thing to be you know politically correct and try to try to try to protect your brand i did it a lot i would talk to you about this a lot before i left for the show remember we had the game night right before a couple days before i left yeah and we were talking and, and taylor was there like hey dude here's a couple chirps hit him with a couple no of doubt these. and then you were and like you hey, know me here's a couple chirps hey dude you gotta get it and i'm like yeah, i dude. told you you gotta give me your handle on twitter you gotta <laughs> let me work <laughs> out true. there <laughs> that's true you know because i'm like you gotta you, you don't want the public perception to be too you know like dang dude i thought right. he was like a you know nice guy and, and i am you know i probably could have went a little bit harder in there but for you Cody, stay, you're staying true to your nature, man. Yeah, you're staying true to every your nature. now and then. The emotion wells up, and you're like, "Hey, this is a competition. We're this got things you're gonna get, you know, caught on camera and TV or whatever. It's all good." But for Cody, he's got these young kids to, to who look up to him, who are like, right. "All right, everybody, pull out your syllabus," like you said, <laughs> and they're like, "Why do you have a black eye?" Oh yeah, I watched you last week on the on the yeah. Ultimate Fighter show. <laughs> it's a, yeah, you gotta. It does have to be tough, but you have to separate. It's like the game of fighting is mm -hmm. is a barbaric. It's a barbaric game, dude. It's violent. You want it to, you want to show that well, side. Well, just like Warrior, like you said, you know, in Warrior, he's fighting in the uh, the parking lots and all that stuff, whatever yeah. it was, in, in the cage in the parking lot. So no matter what, they they know what Cody 
Mr. Gibson. They, Mr. they Gibson. know what Mr. Gibson <laughs> yeah. does anyway. This time it's on for the whole world to see on ESPN. But a couple months ago, before the show, he probably had a fight somewhere and there comes in with a black eye. Mr. Gibson comes in with a black eye or a set of stitches. So yeah. they know. Obviously, the administration is okay with it. And uh, I hope they're doing it just like in the movie Warrior, where they're like putting up the projector, allowing everybody to come to the school to watch yeah, I mean, each that would fight. Be- that's what you, I mean, that's because people ask me that too. They're like, Hey, do you let your, you, do you let your kids watch your fights? Cause aren't you afraid that they're going to hit somebody at school? And I, and I always say, honestly, the more I desensitize them to it a little bit, if I always made it like, Hey, this is a, a thing that we don't show hap. We don't, I don't hit the, bring them to my training. We don't do, then it would be, he would maybe probably always wonder, but since we do watch fights with him and since he does know that daddy's job and I get paid, I feed the family by doing this sport of mixed martial arts. He probably has a better, he's probably the least, the least likely to fight in his, in his class compared to some of the other kids because he is desensitized to it. Not desensitized in a way where it's like, Oh, Hey, we all fight desensitized as fighting is only necessary to a protect my brother or my mom. That's the only thing I ever say, protect your brother, you protect your mom, or if you're getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think you give yourself enough credit. I think parenting and being the leader that you are is, is, is an example as well, because you know, you can see daddy do all these things, whether it's antics and whatever the case may be, but the sport, the art that you're doing is a discipline Mm -hmm. and you you do it within the confinements of like, I'm going to practice, I'm going to training, I'm going, dad's got a fight tonight. And it's for, you know, obviously for yourself, it's self-fulfilling, but for the family as well. And it's under conditions that it's not like you're going around just being an asshole to everybody. And then you come home and then you're a dad, you're a leader and everything else. And you explain it well along the way, which is he's going to, you know, uh, absorb that, regurgitate that. His mind is, he gets to see dad be a leader. It's not like he sees dad fighting. Then he sees him being like this prick or this asshole outside of it to where that's, he's going to be the same way. Or the other guys as well. And that's what I love too. Cause everybody says, Hey man, like, how are those guys in mixed martial arts? Are they just freaking cussing, spitting, fighting? I'm like, no, actually, if my son goes down to train with, goes down to practice with me in Florida, he'll wa- they'll watch us all, you know, spar and we go, it'd be a really, really hard sparring day, everybody beating each other up. And then they're all, and people are laughing with each other and they're hugging each other. And then we get done and they're in Hap's playing with all these guys. He just watched Ong go out there and dang near knock somebody out in a sparring practice and then come over and like, then he's playing soccer with them. He sees this is the sport, this is what we do, but then this is who we are outside of the fighting, you know? So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, for him to be able to have an inside look into, okay, these guys do this on those mats or in that cage, but outside they're just, oh, he's got two sons too. And oh, and he's got a wife and a daughter and, you know, and so it kind of, it, it humanizes us because he gets to be around the guys who fight in a cage for a living, but then are also awesome dudes outside and nice people. For sure. So I, love uh, like, I love that aspect. Yeah. My mom, when we grow up wrestling, obviously you're getting your rough housing around the house and everything else. But the saying would always be no mat, no coach, no wrestle. Mm. So stop, you know, <laughs> no mat, stop no fighting, coach, stop, no wrestle, you know, stop getting into it I out like in public that. and everything else. But yeah, dude, I think, uh, I, I can't say enough about you. You're, you're a phenomenal example as well. I try. And what, what is that saying that I want to say Jordan Peterson says it where it's like, you have that violent side. Mm. But it's be dangerous. Yes. You need to be dangerous, but know when to use it. Right. It's like a, sh- it's like having a sword with you that stays sheathed until you need to pull it out. And it's, and then, until cause I remember, the yeah, sword. but I remember that, yeah, I remember man. that, that interview. Cause the interview that there's another interviewer is like, wait, violent, you need to be violent. He's like, yes, you need to be capable of violence. Right. And, and I think once again, my, one of my favorite books of all time, John, John Eldridge, Wild at Heart, every man needs a battle to fight, an adventure to have, and a beauty to win. And if you deprive yourself of the battles to fight, of the adventures to have, eventually that violence or the, the dark nature that we all probably have inside of us, mm-hmm. you know, it's good to admit that you have it instead of trying to ignore it, and but knowing how to sheath it, knowing when to pull it out. Yeah, you man. Know? And I think uh, going back to the whole, your kids and everything else, I think... Uh, you and I'm sure the majority of guys in the sport with the family, you know, show that example day in and day out to where it, it's, you know, it's not as serious as people probably assume it to be. For sure. Especially if you're not around mixed martial arts. If you just watch it casually on the weekends, mm-hmm. you know, but you've never actually been in the culture community of mixed martial arts, you can probably be like, hmm. I wonder how they are, you know? And of course there's going to be guys who get in trouble and all that stuff, just like any sport where mm-hmm. we're all athletes and we're all competitive and we're all trying to, you know, bust people's heads you know, no, no. no matter what so things are going to happen but um yeah i mean it's always been for me changing the viewpoint changing the perspective of what a mixed martial artist is 
Right. Always, you know, so. Uh, what's the difference for you fighting and coaching? I'm sure uh, it's been asked before. Coaching but. is way harder. Yeah, coaching. Do you feel harder. more emotionally invested in the fight mm -hmm. when you're outside of the octagon than when you're inside the octagon? Yeah. The reason I ask that is, um, you know, whether it's somebody I've watched in football or mentored a little bit in football, but even like wrestling and I, w I would watch my brother. I always felt way more emotional yeah. watching my brother than when I was on the mat. Cause there's that, you know, there's that level of focus, that healthy fear, that balance, that tension. Um, when you're in the circle, when you're on the mat, when you're in the octagon, when you're on the field, mm -hmm. but when you're outside of it and you know, you emotionally invested into somebody else and you see them out there doing it. I almost feel like I was way, I get way more emotional being on the outside than being on the inside. For sure. Yeah. Cause I always, for me, I I've watched a lot, a lot of my friends fight in, you know, the real, the real like fights that I've watched. But then this, this was a little bit different cause it was the reality show, but it's still a real fight inside the confines of a reality show. And it's going to be tough this weekend watching these guys. But for me, I always just know I've done everything right. I've left no stone unturned. I cut weight right. I dieted right. I trained right. Win, lose, or draw. My God still loves me. My family still loves me. And I still love me. I'm good. If I go out there and lose, I could care less. Because it's it's not that I don't hate to lose. I hate to lose. But I also can't think about the end result. I just need to be present in the moment. I need to be where my feet are, whether my feet are on the canvas, mm -hmm. whether I'm flat on my back, whether I'm on, my, on my knees and I'm on top, wherever, wherever I need to be, you know, I just need to be present where I'm at. So I really don't think about the end result. Whereas- Which I've I'm always hated these, that about you, but it, it makes <laughs> yeah. the most sense in the world yeah. because that is true. If you yeah. pour every ounce that you've, that you have into, you know, that- competition mm -hmm. into that process into that journey the result is not for those yeah for those 15 minutes man you're 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 living your dream for yeah. those 15 minutes you can just be the most present you've ever been inside of chaos whereas in everyday life when we're sitting here there's thousands of expectations there's other people pulling at you there's 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 you know i guess doubts and fears and insecurities but inside there you're good, man. Yeah. You know? You're the one that's been in control the whole time and you know you're still in control when you walk yeah. out, which is which is like a freeing, which yeah. is a freeing thought. Yeah. But being the coach, you're not yeah, exactly. in being control. Exactly. Being the coach is tough. Being the coach, you're just like, you know, especially when you're watching two dudes that are, that you care about, my my team, my, my team fighting another teammate. It's, that's really tough for me. Like this weekend watching Kurt Hollibaugh and Austin Hubbard fight is going to be a lot different than me watching Cody I might actually be right. a little bit more nervous, tr truthfully, because Cody, I want Cody to beat Brad so bad because he, you know, that's, right. that's our first, that's our real Chandler versus McGregor fight. And I know how much bad, how bad Cody dis dislikes Brad. Um, whereas Hollibaugh and um, Hubbard this weekend, it's kind of one of those things where I just want both of those guys to A, not get injured, B, fight really, really well. Even if, even if one loses, if he has a good showing, he's most likely going to get that contract. Because my goal always was get these guys on ESPN, have a good showing on ESPN, get them to the finals, and get, get all these guys a contract. Even the guys who lost week one, even Hunter, Hunter might still get a contract. Me making that phone call, me sending that email, you know, and then all the guys leading up to that, guys who made it to the semifinals. Can I get these guys a contract in the UFC? Because all these guys work hard and they deserve it. Yeah. So it's tough, dude. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's like I've I've told you, it's been fun watching it happen, because again, if you're in those guys' shoes, it's they're getting coached by Michael Chandler and Conor McGregor, mm -hmm. and I don't know the McGregor side, and I'm not as invested in McGregor as I am you, but it's like, you know, maybe like for those guys when you're there, it's like, oh man, it's cool that I'm getting coached by McGregor. Oh, it's it's cool that I'm getting coached by Michael Chandler. Mm -hmm. But when you get to their level and relate to them and you put your co coaching hat on, it's like they get to go, they get to leave, they get to walk away having just a different perspective. Like mm -hmm. I really got more out of that than the theatric of, oh, this person's coaching me. Yeah. Like they connected cool. with me on a way to where I can take something back. I can take something home. Well, And, and I feel like there was you know, we only saw, I mean, 12 hours is a very long time, but it's split between two teams, but there was so many, so many more things that I wish were shown on the show. I wish it was a three hour show every week because there's so much going on. My coaching staff, I wish my coaching staff would have got a little bit more shine because I, we would not have had the success that we had if it was just me and then some random coaches mm -hmm. or whatever. My coaching staff loved these dudes loved on these dudes, served these dudes 24 seven for five weeks, you know? And, uh, 
it was uh it was good i put together a really good coaching staff and i'm not saying that that i put it together luckily guys were available and i was able to get some good guys and they were the perfect guys to have there. oh brother we all know you are the Michael Humble Chandler, baby. The what? The Michael Humble, humble Chandler. Chandler. No, but the most did, humble did, cat yeah. in the game. I did a little, I did, I did, I did well. Team Chandler yeah, did well. Team Chandler I did, did well, well as a coach. People say, do you want to coach after you're done fighting? Absolutely not. But you don't? No. no. Why no. not? I mean, if I was making Bill Belichick money, maybe, but like, you know, no. Right. It's it's I, feel I like think you I think you'll mentor somebody. I'll at probably some point mentor in time. and I'll be at the gym. I'll stay in shape, but I'm not gonna be traveling on the weekends taking these guys yeah. to, to fights and stuff. But I'm saying your spirit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it's just a lot of time. And then I got to make sure these dudes actually care as much as I care. The, pro, the biggest thing that I would have a problem with is making sure I'm not leading this kid down a path to get him to where he wants to go or says where he wants to go. But then he doesn't actually have the lifestyle, the champion mentality, the the clean lifestyle that I think he has to have in order to be successful. That's okay. You know? That's no. where you come in. Yeah. Oh, let's see, but I can't do it. You're wasting my time, dude. I should be at dinner with my wife and my kids right now. And you're wasting my time. And that'll be a good moment. That'll fighting. be a good I'll moment. I would end up fighting my yeah. guys. Like yeah. I would end up fighting all of my guys because they, their work ethic probably isn't there. Right. The dedication right, right, right. probably isn't there. And I could be wrong. That's in the a, short a very... term, probably not. I'm just saying like, yeah. as your kids get older, oh, like my, I yeah. think the same thing, like, I say, hell no, I'll never get into coaching, but I, I just think at some point it'll come back around because just your love for not necessarily yeah. the competition, but all the lessons, the virtues and everything that comes with mm -hmm. sport and discipline and everything else. I think at some point you want to attach yourself to it along the way. If you see something in somebody or want to dip your toes, whether it's high school wrestling, high school football, yeah. whether you just, just cause you, you know why acquire all this knowledge if you can't pass it along at some point. Very true. And also I'm in it still, you know, I'm still yeah, in it. Yeah. But the, the moment I lay the gloves down, I'm sure I'm be like, okay, what do I do now? How do I stay connected to sport? Because right now I'm still in it. So of course I say, no, yeah. I'm not going to, but, but I could definitely see myself probably coaching wrestling more than MMA. You'd be, be you'll honest. be great at it. I I'm not, you'd be I'm great probably at not that it, great of a wrestler anymore. I don't really remember all it. Don't would need to be. come back. It would come back though. You yeah. Know, I just, I'd be more like a, a mindset wrestling yeah. coach more than I would be a, Hey, hit that high crouch and then finish off to a double leg and put the, put your foot here. I mean, how many guys that came along the way in your career and your journey to where they might not have had the background that the great coaches that coached you, but they have the the right conversations at the right time mm -hmm. that give you kind of that confidence and whatever you needed at that moment to go on to the next thing. We were, it's, you don't have to be the most equipped person to be a coach. Yeah, we, we were just talking about that because I just had Tyler McCormick I wrestled with in college at Mizzou. So we had like seven seven dudes here this weekend on Tyler's bachelor party. And we all just were just sitting around talking about wrestling. And our the the stories that we talked about the most, most were the, the assistant coaches who, who impacted us more on a human level than, than they did on a crab ride, high crotch, double right. leg type of X's and O stuff. Like you remember Pat McNamara, poured into us and Bart Horton and Sean Charles, these guys poured into us and made us believe in ourselves. Therefore we went out there and were able to do the X's and O's of the sport, you know, and it's, so that's why you always say a coach will impact more people in one year than most people do in their entire lifetimes, you know, yeah. and that's why, so it is a, a very fulfilling thing and just don't want to spend too much time on it. Cause I've been away from my family way too much. The <laughs> yeah, last 15 yeah, yeah. years. You know? No doubt. No doubt. You'll definitely have your fun, but, but um, well, no, dude. I, uh, I, we need to get you out of here. So oh, yeah, for those, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just late. Hey, hey. So just oh, so everybody no. knows, yeah, that's the Will. I, I hijacked Will from busting with the boys. He's supposed to go. Oh yeah, you were supposed to leave about twenty minutes ago. Yeah. So I'm gonna let Will get out of here. Uh, I might finish here a few minutes on my on my own as well, and then uh, we'll do a couple other things. Don't forget, this was episode twelve. We do have one more after tough um episode will be our 13th episode where we kind of recap the entire season i'm gonna try to get some of my guys on via zoom i probably shouldn't say that but hopefully we can get some of my guys on via zoom but will get out of here dude you <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, that's, I'll tell hey, you know you, we were having some good conversation because I wasn't even, I was like, I okay, know. I'm probably right on round no, now. No, dude. Well, I and I'm sorry, I should have checked, dude. You're know, 26 minutes late. I should have the vibration going hey, off. If you get the fired, dude, there's, all, there's always a home right here on this <laughs> mic right here on a weekly basis. Bye. Dude, thanks for having me, man. All right. all right, we'll see you guys later. See you at the top. See you at the top. Hey, seriously, if you get fired, man, there's always a spot over here. Okay? Love ya. Maybe you should keep that keep that little audio rolling. No, seriously, man. All right, we're back. Are we still rolling? Yeah, still going. Okay, that'd be cool if we're still rolling. All right, hey, we're still rolling. Hey, guys, the... 
for those of you who don't know and have not subscribed, number one, you're missing out because Will T Will Compton, uh, Taylor Lewan have been doing busting with the boys now for shoot a very long time, and they are absolutely hilarious. Get a lot of football players on their um, on their podcast and a lot of really cool people. They just had Nate Bargatze on there, which was cool. Um, who's one of the funniest dudes on the planet and been a friend of the bus for a long time. A friend of mine. He's been here on our show. Um, but yeah, I figure uh, just a couple minutes of of kind of a recap now that we just got done. You know, it's funny because this entire time I've, to be quite honest with you, I've been like, man, I can't wait until tough is over because this, you know, doing this show every week is a little tough. I love bringing you guys value. I love the response so far. But now that, you know, we just got done with episode 12, it's a little sad. You know, we just uh, got done with it. Me and Connor over there, we'll give a round of applause for Connor. He's been freaking crushing it. Um, and uh, so this weekend in Boston, I'm heading to Boston. I'm actually headed to Bristol, Connecticut right now, which is where we're here on Monday. Um, I'll be at ESPN for a couple of days, going to do a bunch of shows on Sports Center and stuff. Come back for a day or two, then I go out to Boston um, to watch these fights. I was going to go no matter what. And people said, you know, are you going just to watch? And I said, I'm going to close the chapter. I'm going to finish the job. Um, I believe that finishing what you started is the most important thing in life. And uh, me making sure I was he here this weekend in Boston to watch Cody beat Brad, to watch Kurt and Austin fight each other. May the best man win on that one. It's going to be tough to watch. Um, I got some gifts for these guys. And um, I just want to be there. You know, I'm going to bring the jersey. I don't know if I'm going to wear the jersey. I might wear the jersey. Who knows? It'd be kind of funny if I actually show up to the, to the fights in the jersey. Um, but I just want to finish the chapter and see through the commitment that I made to these guys. Um, this was a life changing experience for me. Um, you know, even going back to, to Will, like the question of what I coach, I would loved, I loved coaching these guys. I loved that these guys got the greatest second chance they ever could have asked for. Uh, I loved being on ESPN every single week. I loved having, having the response that y'all have shown us for the last three months now. Um, it's been a lot of fun and, um, we're going to close the chapter this week end on here in a couple of days in Boston. So, um, it's been a fun ride and I appreciate you guys for the support. Um, big time. The reaction to this show has been awesome. And you know, we're going to be sitting right here at this, on this chair, on this microphone, uh, bringing you guys more content. We're going to continue with our walk on wisdoms. We're going to start interviewing more people on our podcast, start doing more and more stuff. This has been a really cool experience for me. And now I've become addicted to, uh, talking on the microphone and bringing you guys a value. So thank you guys for shoot. We're getting close to a hundred thousand subscribers and we just started posting content for four, five months ago, maybe. Um, so y'all's response thus far has been awesome. This will be a, you know, this with the show and the next show will be a really good cornerstone of throw your comments in the comment section, start the conversations, me and Connor go through them. We're reading them. I'm responding to a lot of them. I'll probably be on Wednesday. I'll be traveling, but I'll probably be in the comments whenever this show goes live. So throw your stuff in the comments and I'll be responding to people. Um, but this show and the next show, throw all your stuff in the comments of what you thought about the season, what you liked, what you, what you didn't necessarily like, what we could be doing better. Uh, because we over here, um, are trying to bring you guys value and trying to become the best show that we possibly can be. And we've had some really great guests, um, the last 12 episodes and it's been a lot of fun. So thank you guys. Um, and, uh, we're heading to Bristol today here in a couple hours. So I got to go. So appreciate you guys. Thank you to Will Compton. Uh, if you guys haven't subscribed to busting with the boys podcast, do it. You will not be, uh, let down and make sure you like subscribe, comment here on YouTube, share with all your friends. If you're listening on the audio, um, congratulations to all of our winners. We do have one winner next week, right? Connor, we do have, we do have one left because we didn't, we didn't do a giveaway for the first show because we just kind of announced it, I believe. So we still have one left. So the link is in my bio on Instagram. The link is in the show notes here on YouTube. And the link is also in the show notes on your, on the audio as well. So there's a bunch of different ways to, uh, to enter subscribing to the, to the, to my YouTube channel is number, number one, as well as walk on fitness, my fitness app that we are going to be bringing you more and more, um, video and audio too as well, more programs, fitness, diet, nutrition, and mindset. So uh, appreciate you guys for this support. Appreciate you guys being on this journey with me. And we ain't even close to being done. I will be fighting Connor. 
maybe by the end of the year. That's what he says. We'll see what Dana says this weekend when I see him in Boston. And uh, hopefully we'll have an announcement coming soon. So thank you guys. Love y'all. God bless. We'll see you at the top.